the second speaker in the third period is uh, really the Red Wings finished the bottom of the NHL standings in 2020, just as they did in 1977. Well, one of our SIR members, Bill Collins, who covered the 77 Red Wings as a reporter, will explain in 10 ways, the 10 ways in which these historically awful teams were very similar. Take it away, Bill. Hey, great. Um, I'm going to read from uh, some notes here. I put together a, uh, a slide presentation. Can you hear me okay, Bill? Yes, I can hear. A little bit of echo, but I can hear fine. Okay. Um, hmm. Oh, well, no. if it gets... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Just keep talking. Okay, sounds good. Um, anyway, well, let me just get started. Uh, as you uh, pointed out earlier, um, this presentation deals with the 10 parallels uh, among the two worst teams in Red Wing history. If you're a Red Wing fan, it's a sad story. It reads like a bad soap opera. But if you don't like the Red Wings, or if you're a Red Wing hater, then this is your kind of presentation. Um, if we take a look at the 93-year uh, history of the Red Wings, uh, if you just take a look, you can see that historically there are three teams that stand out uh, worst among all, right? So uh, the 85-86 team, uh, we're going by points percentage as all three of these teams play under different point systems. Uh, the 85-86 team comes in at 250, 76, 77 at 256, and then last year's team at uh, 0.275. But essentially, you could throw a blanket around all three of these teams. But I'm going to make a call and eliminate the 85-86 Red Wings for the following reasons. Uh, they have two Hall of Famers on the team. Steve Eisenman missed 30 games that season with a knee injury. Adam Oates is a rookie who played just half the season. Injuries and trades uh, decimated the blue line. And goalie Greg Stephan, uh, thanks to two uh, suspensions, uh, missed 14 games actually due to suspensions for various stick swinging infractions. Uh, the following year, they did get to the Campbell Conference Finals against Edmonton. So you would have to say a horrible season, but uh, a promising team. So that leaves us really two teams. 2019-20 uh, is one of them. Uh, this is Steve Eiserman's first year as general manager of the team in his co news conference uh, being introduced, or reintroduced, you, you could say, in the role of general manager, tries to manage expectations for this team. Fans hoped that it was a rebuilding year, but uh, they really hit rock bottom, uh, unfortunately. Now, on the other hand, you look at the 76-77 team, it's their golden anniversary franchise, right? The time for a celebration. Unfortunately, the drama continues that was uh, a part of Red Wing hockey in the 1970s. Uh, Alex Del Vecchio coaches the first half of the season as coach and GM then turns the reins over to Larry Wilson, a former teammate of his, and things go from bad to worse. If you look at the record book, uh, the team is famous for two things, the longest winless streak in Red Wing history in one season, 19 games, and the 76-77 team culminates the longest playoff drought in Red Wing history at seven seasons. But this team really fits into what we all know as the Dead Wings era, which uh, runs from 1967 to 1982. Basically, the last 15 years of the Bruce Norris ownership regime. They only make the playoffs twice. As you can see there, they made it in 1969-70, uh, a great season with 95 points. But in the offseason, Norris hires Ned Hartness, a college coach, a rah-rah guy from Cornell, and Ned, unfortunately, was a personal and professional disaster. Uh, he inherited a veteran team that rejected his petty rules on mustaches, cigars, and four-letter words, and the team declined by 40 points. I'm not sure if that's an NHL record or not, but... Um, certainly worthy of uh, consideration. Uh, one night in Toronto, the team gets beat 13 to nothing. They essentially quit on Harkness. The general manager, Sid Abel, tries to fire Harkness. The owner won't let him do it, so Sid quits, and Harkness is promoted to GM. And that's the way they rolled in 1971. 
Back in the 70s, the Dead Rings era, if uh, you want to use an alliteration, uh, dysfunction, drama, and self-destruction uh, in Detroit. You see these uh, headlines, uh, you know, Gordy Howe retires in 1971, then takes a million dollar contract and moves the family to Houston. They have a superstar, a budding superstar in Marcel Dion, but he wants out. He turns down a million dollars to stay. Uh, Red Wings' Dan Maloney is uh, hauled up on assault charges in Ontario. Uh, Doug Barkley punches out a reporter in uh, New York. Mickey Redmond, 50-goal uh, scorer, is waived, characterized as a disruptive influence. Bruce Norris, uh, the owner, is at war with the press, and so it goes. And you would have to say that this gloomy situation, I looked over the clips, is really best explained not by a player, but by a player's wife, Colleen Howe, who wrote a guest column in the New York Times in 1974. This is one year after she'd moved the family to Houston. She talks about last August after most emotional strain, we chiseled the Red Wing emblem off our hearts and headed for Houston found a combination of winning personalities unlike we had ever known before. And let's face it, the whole difference is being with the right job environment that's conducive to happiness. So happy in Houston, uh, no longer depressed in Detroit. Let's move along to what uh, the guts of the presentation, which I'm, I'm taking a look at here, the 10 parallels between these two teams. Uh, one way to do this is look at how they did in terms of goals for and goals against uh, against the league average in these respective years. You can see the 76-77 team can't put it in the ocean, 31% below the NHL average. The 85-86 team uh, can't stop the beach ball, right? They are the exact opposite. Uh, they uh, defend at 31% above the NHL average. 2019-20 Red Wings, though, are an ugly combination of both, uh, allowing uh, 29 percent above the NHL average and scoring at a rate 30 percent below the uh, NHL average. So that's on the ice. Uh, the question moves to the second, right, number two, Red Wings leadership and the owners. The owners of these two teams are really um, the sons of, of transformational owners, right? You've got Bruce Norris who owned the Red Wings from 55 to 82. And then the owner of the current team, Chris Illich, who has been around since 2017, uh, early on in his tenure as, uh, as Red Wing owner. But they're the sons of the two men who transformed hockey in the city of Detroit, and that's James Norris on the left and Mike Illich on the right. Now, Norris bought the team in 1932, rescued it from uh, financial ruin in the middle of the Depression, He's uh, running a great grain business based in Chicago. And over the next 20 years, he wins five Stanley Cups. Norris was a dynamo, right? He uh, owned also uh, Chicago Stadium, uh, installed his son Jim as a co-owner of the Blackhawks, owned a controlling interest in Madison Square Garden where the New York Rangers played. And when the Boston Bruins ran into financial problems in the 1930s, he provided the money to survive. So uh, a very influential and powerful player uh, in the NHL in the 1930s, 40s, and early 50s until his death uh, in 1952. Mike Lynch, you're familiar with, four Stanley Cups in 35 years, uh, rescuing a moribund franchise and turning it into an NHL powerhouse. Uh, in 1952, uh, Bruce Norris uh, didn't take over the team. When his father died, uh, following the family wishes, uh, Jim Sr. Uh, asked that Marguerite, his 25-year-old sister, be installed as the leader. And that's what they did. She was a Smith College graduate working for Ben and Bradstreet in New York, moved to Detroit, lived in the city, and became a hands-on part of the club, working alongside Jack Adams there with her hands on the Stanley Cup. Two Stanley Cups in three years for her. Uh, but in 1955, uh, in a little bit of palace intrigue, uh, she's in Boston on a road trip, picks up the paper and finds out that Terry Sawchuk, following the uh, Stanley Cup win in 55, has been traded to the Boston Bruins. When she picks up the phone and calls Bruce, Bruce informs her that he has uh, 
now in charge, that he has won the support of his mother and his brother Jim. He's in and she is out. And uh, so it goes uh, for the next 27 years. Uh, Bruce, as you can see right there, that's his Hockey Hall of Fame card. He was uh, voted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. He's the youngest ever elected into the Hockey Hall of Fame in the builders category, age 45. I think it's pretty safe to say he was uh, given the award rather than achieved it. Um, the tape on his uh, last few years is, is pretty tough. Uh, missed the playoffs the last 15 of the 17 years, $12 million losses over the last four years, 13 different coaches. He brought in the investment bankers to price the team uh, for sale. Uh, they did so at $20 million in 1979, but three years later, he sells it to Mike Illich for $8 million. Uh, and um, unfortunately, he did not have much more success in the green business uh, as it files for bankruptcy just eight months before he passes away at age 61. Uh, as we continue on to take a look at uh, these owners, right, uh, Chris Illich, um, like Bruce Norris, also uh, won, uh, let's call it an internal family conflict with his Older sister Denise in 2004. After this uh, conflict, he's installed as president and CEO of Illich Enterprises. And then later, uh, as you can see uh, on the right there, with his uh, uh, the blessings of his mother and father, uh, they put him in charge of the uh, Red Wings and Tigers uh, uh, sports franchises. The jury really uh, out on the uh, Illich. Uh, the Athletic uh, did a survey of 1,700 plus Red Wing fans in April. Uh, the question, what is your confidence level in Chris Illich? You can see uh, not real strong feelings on either side. Most people are in the middle. Um, I would say that his reputation and, and really that of the Illich family will largely be determined, not so much by how many hockey or baseball games they win over the next few years, but whether uh, he can deliver on all the promises he's made with the District of Detroit, the historic redevelopment, and uh, the real estate uh, initiatives for the city of Detroit. In other words, uh, will he deliver for everybody in the city of Detroit and not just the business community? Number three, um, underneath the owners, of course, the general managers that run these teams, and we've got two not just Red Wing legends, but two NHL legends, right? Alex Delvecchio and Steve Eisman. When you look at the tail of the tape of these two, it's uh, amazing how identical they, uh, they pretty much are. Alex plays 24 seasons in NHL record with one club. Eisman has 22 in a Red Wing uniform. Each wins three Stanley Cups. Alex retires the number two scorer. Eisman hangs up the skates as number six. Uh, they're both captains, Alex for 12 seasons, Eisenman for an NHL record 19. They're centers, both in the Hockey Hall of Fame and, uh, as we're talking right now, GMs of these historically awful teams. I feel bad for Alex. I always felt he was doomed as a Red Wing executive. In 1973, when he took over, he said, this is the greatest thing to happen in my career, which is really saying a lot, given uh, his career in three Stanley Cups. But he was born into really a, a dysfunctional, if not toxic environment, and uh, with nobody to role model, I think really struggled. Eisenman, you can see him standing there, um, very fortunate, right? Got to learn the ropes from three Hall of Fame mentors. On his right, Jimmy Davilano, who drafted him in 1983. Uh, Ken Holland, his general manager, and of course, Mike Illich. And the tale of the tape indicates really this sort of uh, a lack of training, if uh, if you want to put it that way. Um, you know, Alex uh, trading his star player, Dion, shuffling coaches, three unproductive NHL drafts, misses the playoffs by a mile in four uh, seasons, and ultimately fired in March of 77 and replaced by uh, Ted Lindsay. Uh, a different story for Eiserman, right? Uh, starts in 2006 with the organization. Uh, leads Team Canada to gold medal wins in the 2010 and 2014 Olympics. Uh, GM of the Tampa Bay Lightning. They get to the finals in 2013, 
And he's got his fingerprints, I think, all over that team uh, that just won the cup uh, a couple of months ago. And uh, now, of course, uh, here in Detroit. Um, you, know, you know, when I was covering that team in 76, 77, I was an 18-year-old college student. I had a part-time job at the uh, Detroit Free Press. Uh, don't want to exaggerate it. Uh, mostly glue pot uh, filler and uh, gopher. Uh, but uh, at the games, I did get to shag quotes and work with Tom Henderson, the former beat writer of the uh, Free Press. Uh, a couple of quotes here. Alex uh, saying, you know, we've had coaches here in Detroit in the past. Maybe they've been sentimental choices. Even myself, you know, just because I play doesn't mean I'm a great coach. And um, Henderson on Alex says, I thought at the time that Alex never wanted to be coach. He never wanted to be GM. The team was his family. After he was done playing, it was his duty to do what was asked of him. And um, I don't know, sometimes if you do things out of loyalty or obligation, um, it doesn't work out so great. And of course, uh, Brian Burke's comment, you might have seen it uh, in the newspapers. He calls him MacGyver and thinks the moves he's made are sure genius. Uh, we shall see. Uh, number four, where has all the scoring gone, right? Neither of these two teams can score. The 76-77 team is interesting uh, in, in the sense, in 1975, they had three great scorers. Danny Grant, you see on the left, a 50-goal scorer. Marcel Dion, third in the league in scoring, and two-time 50-goal scorer, Mickey Redmond. But Grant uh, suffers uh, a serious leg and then a serious knee injury over the next two years. Dion leaves. He won. Tired of losing, doesn't want to be in Detroit, so he's traded. And Mickey Redman has a bad back and ultimately retires in 1976 yeah. uh, at the age of uh, yeah. 29. So, I just need the magnesium. Um, anyway, uh, moving on, uh, number five, when a uh, betting star becomes uh, a plus minus disaster. I have to admit to, to all our, our friends who study yeah, the, uh, the analytics, here. I agree I that, that the, uh, stuff. the plus. Oh. Uh, someone may want to hit mute there. Uh, I agree uh, that the um, the plus minus stat really is uh, the most hated in hockey and understand its shortcomings. But I would say in the case of Athens, Sierra and Bergeron, for example, if you're minus 45 one, five, and 46 six. games, uh, you're definitely no change. A, uh, There's no one change that happens uh, not a, uh, tonight. A victim of circumstance. Um, so what do you do uh, with, with these assets? Well, you trade them. And uh, interestingly enough, um, they're very valuable. Uh, the Red Wings trade Bergeron to the New York Islanders and get back Andre saint who scores 31 goals the next year and helps them get to the playoffs. And you saw Steve Eiserman uh, trade Athens CU to the uh, Edmonton Oilers. Uh, his career is, looks like it's come off the rails at the moment, had a tough time in Edmonton, but on a team at the moment. But uh, the Red Wings pick up two second round picks and have Sam Gagne sign for next year. Now, we all know injuries are a, a factor that seems to impact teams uh, much more uh, severely uh, in, uh, in, in seasons like this. Uh, in 76, the Red Wings had Dan Maloney, an intimidating physical presence, coming off a 27 goal, 200 penalty minute season. Uh, but he breaks his shoulder uh, just before Christmas. And this is like losing your big brother, right? Uh, without Maloney in the lineup, the team wins four of their next 46 games. Uh, on the other hand, Anthony Mantha, a power forward, not quite the uh, physical presence of, uh, of Maloney, but nonetheless a, a power forward who's basically 40% of the Red Wings offense when he's in the lineup. He only plays 43 games and without him, uh, the team was uh, even more toothless uh, than it was uh, otherwise. Number seven, we move on. Uh, when the next great prospect is a right-handed defenseman in 76-77, it's Reed Larson. Larson um, assaults a referee in a college game and is kicked out for the rest of the year. So what do you do? You sign your pro contract. He shows up in Detroit. He only plays 14 games. He's 20 years old. But uh, he would go on the next year to uh, set an NHL record for rookie points by a defenseman and, uh, you know, part of the team's uh, effort to get to the playoffs. Um, his equivalent here for this comparison, Moritz Sider, 
uh, loan to Rogla of the uh, Swedish Elite League. Many people feel he'll be Detroit bound when he finishes his uh, term of the Swedish team there uh, in April, we shall see. Uh, number eight is the NHL draft. Both of these teams had the number four overall pick uh, in these seasons. Uh, the Red Wings took a, a guy named Freddie Williams, one of the most uh, disastrous and, and puzzling selections uh, in their history. Uh, what's strange about it is that Williams was uh, not just uh, the second best center on, on the sheet. He was the second best center on uh, the team from which he was taken, the Saskatoon Blades. Uh, strangely, they could have taken Bernie Federko, who had 69 more points and 41 more goals than uh, Freddie. And uh, this really turned out to be uh, a, a disaster, right? Um, Freddie plays just half a season with the Red Wings, seven points in 44 games, gets sent to the minors, never to see the NHL again. Meanwhile, Federko, who everybody thought would be uh, chosen at number four, uh, goes on to play uh, 1,000 NHL games, 1,130 points. He's in the uh, Hockey Hall of Fame. I should also say that we're not done with Federko. In 1989, Detroit traded for him. Uh, and in order to get him for just one season, they sent another future Hall of Famer, Adam Oates, to St. Louis. But enough about uh, Bernie Federko. Um, this year, Lucas Raymond taken at number four overall in round one. Uh, that's a rational choice. It lines up with uh, the conventional wisdom and the, uh, the talk in the scouting community. He uh, appears to be an elite player. Uh, we'll see, but definitely a differentiator between uh, Del Vecchio, who took uh, a chance and, and reached for Freddie Williams, and uh, Eisenman, who went with a safe choice. Number nine, the goalies in twilight time. It's, uh, as they say, it's tough to be uh, an old goalie uh, on a bad team. Uh, you see Eddie Jockerman there in 1976-77, at age 38, 13 seasons under his belt. He actually had three shutouts in the first four weeks of the season. But um, at age 38, you're not the future. No takers on the waiver wire, and he joins the front office with a smile on his face. Uh, not the same for uh, Jimmy Howard. Um, the end, swift and terrible for Jimmy. He seemed to lose his game overnight. Uh, he goes 2-23-2, and two, loses his last 20 games, uh, has the NHL's worst goals against average, and uh, Detroit declined to renew his contract. So he's looking for a place to play uh, right now. Finally, um, to the front office, back to the front office here, marketing desperation. Uh, the team's trying to engage a frustrated fan base as the losses pile up. Red Wing attendance since 2014, which peaked uh, in that year, is down 24%. That's, uh, that's a, a gross number, the, the gross attendance. And you can see lots of the empty red seats. What do you do with uh, empty red seats, which are a bit of an eyesore on uh, television? Well, you, uh, you cover them. You reupholster them in black and... And now you have uh, black uh, empty seats. Uh, I don't know if that's any better, but uh, it fits under the coach uh, or the classification of uh, marketing desperation, I would say. Um, offering free tickets, right? Buy one, get one free. And I think we've all heard of the woo. I won't uh, spend any more time on that. Final slide, the marketing desperation of the 1976-77 uh, season. Guaranteed win night at the Detroit Olympia. In the throes of that 19-game unbeaten string, they offer uh, fans attending the uh, next to the last home game uh, a free ticket to the home uh, finale if they beat the Minnesota North Stars, guaranteed win night. Uh, the game is tied 1-1 midway through the third period, but uh, Dean Talifas and Jim Roberts score for Minnesota, sending uh, 8,000 uh, disappointed, but certainly not surprised, fans home. And uh, I think the final one is a, a disco single that was uh, released uh, called Do It To Me Red Wings. It was the disco era. I will not uh, play that song uh, for reasons of good taste. And uh, with that, uh, that should do the uh, presentation. Just wanted to uh, uh, thank Sue for the opportunity and uh, Bill and our partners at Michigan Tech for all the uh, technical assistance. 
Th thanks very much, uh, uh, Bill. The uh, one question did come up, but there were a few uh, ones that people responded, but one of the things that I think Claudia asked, do you think that had Margarita uh, stayed around longer, that the Red Wings would have won more Stanley Cups? You know, it's, um, you, you really wonder. Um, I, I, I would have to say that uh, I would have preferred to, um, uh, to see her in, in a managerial capacity. First of all, Bruce was an absentee owner who lived in Chicago and tried to do this remotely. She lived uh, in the Motor City. Uh, by all accounts, I think she probably had a better head for business, uh, even though Bruce was the guy who took over. So uh, would they have won more Stanley Cups? I don't know, uh, but it certainly uh, is a possibility. And, and and while we're talking about Hockey Hall of Fame, I mean, you know, if, um, if we're looking for people, I mean, you know, she won two Stanley Cups in three years. Bruce didn't win any, and, and he's in the Hall of Fame. So, um, I don't know, why not, uh, why not throw Marguerite's name into the hopper for consideration? And I guess we should ask you right off is, uh, what do you per expect the Red Wings to do this year? You know, I... I don't think it's a stretch to say they'll need much better. Uh, unlike uh, the 85, 86, and the 76, 70, 70, I, I don't expect them to get to the playoffs, but I, I think they'll be much better. Oh, good. Any other uh, questions right off? Thanks, Bill. Thank you.